Hi, I'm Nick Briggs. I'm the executive producer of Big Finish Productions and the voice of the Daleks, and you're listening to Mark Fool 42. Welcome to Mark Who 42. That's right, Mark Who 42, Doctor Who on Krypton Radio. I'm your host, Mark Baumgarten. We, of course, have Patty Hawkins, Christian Basil, and Kayla Oscalillo on, but we also have another person on the show, and he is legendary. It's Nicholas Briggs. Hello, Nick. Hello. Hi. Nicholas Briggs is uh, ex- your, your executive producer at Big Finish Productions. Correct. Correct. Is this a quiz? You are a writer. You are a <laughs> director. You are an actor. You've been on Doctor Who as, well, you haven't, you've kind of been on Doctor Who. Your voice has been on Doctor Who. Yes. And you've been a fan since God knows when. I think that's more or less correct. Wow. Yes, since I can remember. I was born before Doctor Who started. Right. Yes, I, I have that. So you probably, when you were a little kid, watched William Hartnell. Yes, I, mean, I do remember William Hartnell. I remember seeing uh, his final year. I, I, I have memories of that, yes. So, but I must have seen some before, because the Daleks weren't a shock to me when I uh, saw Power of the Daleks, so I must have seen something before. So you actually got to see Power of the Daleks. You mm-hmm. watched that. And Evil of the Daleks, obviously. You know, but I remember watching it when the BBC repeated it. I remember, you know, because I was still very young, but I remember getting about, you know, halfway into episode one and thinking, hold on, I've seen this before. <laughs> But those episodes, they're some of the ones that were wiped and are missing. And so we we can't actually watch them. Now, we can watch them as, as reconstructions. I know fans have put out with the screen caps. Mm. They've put out with the audio and you can watch it, you know, on the underground Doctor Who people. <laughs> yes. uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm holding out. I, I've seen it that way. Let me Let me put it that way. I've seen Power of the Daleks, but not the way it was meant to be seen. Yeah. So you you got you go. I do, yeah, yeah. I did see it, and um, it has to it has to be said that every time they um, uh, announce that they've found uh, uh, you know one of the old episodes, I always say to my friend Rob Shearman, I say, "What well, what is it? What is it?" They found. I say, "Unless it's Evil of the Daleks, I'm not interested." <laughs> <laughs> Because um, I don't, I don't quite know what I would do if if Power of the Daleks and Evil of the Daleks came back. Because let me just tell you a little sad story about how much of a Doctor Who fan I am. When um, uh, the um, the Web of Fear uh, was uh, recovered, I was in New York at a Comic Con at the time, mm-hmm. and I was woken up in the early hours of the morning by uh, a text on my mobile phone from someone who obviously didn't know I was in America saying, uh, how excited are we that uh, uh, Web of Fear is available on iTunes right now? And I thought, what? Oh, uh, and then I thought, I could I could buy it now. So I did. Uh-huh. And then, you know, from, I don't know, it was sort of like one o'clock in the morning or something. And, uh, and I sat there and I watched it. And... Um, it was amazing. I, I remember t- I texted uh, um, Fraser Hines while I was watching it. It's like, I'm watching you now. you know. And then I went and had a shower before breakfast. And in the shower, I just broke down and cried like a child. I just, the whole thing was completely overwhelming for me. It was a bit like a sort of a, a, a relative who's been dead for many years, suddenly knocking on the door and saying, hi, I'm still around. It was that emotional for me, really. Wow. Because I never thought I'd see it again. You know, I, re- I had a sort of misty memory of it. And there it was. And I kept remember bits. I thought, oh, I, do- I remember this bit. You know, it was, it was remarkable, really. And that, yeah, you know, it's difficult to explain uh, how it makes you feel to people who are not fans of Doctor Who. You know, they must. You can imagine telling that to people who either never heard of Doctor Who or don't care for it much. And them just looking at you and... Uh... Uh, <laughs> how, how do you get to wrap their heads around? Okay, imagine that all the copies of Empire Strikes Back disappeared. Yes. <laughs> and then... <laughs> sit, sit, and they, they all magically disappeared and then somebody found a copy. Yeah. That's that's the elevator. Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's kind of that mentality that the new generation of Doctor Who's have, that the Whovians have come out here, versus our generation grew up with the PBS and, and all the channels that came out, grew up with uh, with John in America, Pertwee, of course, yeah. in America, with John Pertwee, Tom Baker, and so on. And when you hear one of the Whovians go, oh, I love Matt Smith. He's my favorite third doctor. I'm like, <laughs> oh. No. <laughs> go, uh, well, well, in their defense, when I was watching on PBS, and Nicholas, I, I tell this story all the time, is that my PBS always ran Tom Baker. So right. for five years straight, I thought Robot was the beginning of the series and Logopolis was the end. And my doctor dropped off a tower, became a blonde, and that started all over again. That was the end of the series. <laughs> then somebody came up and goes, oh, the five doctors came out. We're going to put a special on. I'm like, five doctors? <laughs> By the way, there's three more before him. I'm like, what? Yes, yeah. So yeah. we had a lot of catching up to do over there but i just i'm going back to your statement when you mentioned that you were a doctor who fan since when i can only picture you coming out of the womb with a sonic screwdriver attached <laughs> <laughs> what is that now you do the voice of the daleks you play the voice of the cybermen on the new show but i don't know if a lot of people know that you've actually in several different media formats played the doctor this is true i have well i had i don't have any more I had the Doctor Who magazine where they kind of trick you into you're going to be the the new Doctor, and they, yeah, there's exactly. a it's you. I mean, they, they they drew you. They did, yes. I love that. And then you also were that was, uh, the, the, se- that was the second time they'd done it though, because they there was also another um, strip a few years before. Uh, oh, where, it was Party Animals, wasn't it? Party Animals, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. But the later one when you were just supposed to ninth Doctor, I was just like. This is great. That was quite controversial at the time. It was. I remember the controversy. Yeah, yeah, it was. Because, you know, have you heard that in London, every first Thursday of the month, there's a particular pub. It's actually being being closed for refurbishment at the moment, but it's called the Fitzroy Tavern. Yeah, yes. And, yeah, and uh, Doctor Who fans meet there the first Thursday of every month. So you can just wander along there. And, and I remember, and this was, called, of course, way before the new series came back. And I worked at the Sci-Fi Channel just along the road from the Fitzroy Tavern, actually in the same road. And I wandered along there uh, one first Thursday of the month. And as I was went to go in the pub, a friend of mine greeted me at the door. And he just, uh, he sort of, I think he physically restrained me from going in. And he said, you do not want to go in there. And I said, why? And then he showed me the Doctor Who magazine and he just said, this. And I went, what? And I I don't know, but I think there was equal measure of joy and anger. I sort of looked over his shoulder and saw a few people glare at me, and I said, I better go home then. (laughs) Uh, Now, the doctor that was in Party Animals was based on, and this was the other version of the doctor you played, you were in a series of unofficial audio dramas way before Big Finish was even a sparkle in the atmosphere, an idea. (laughs) For audiovisuals, you did you you played the doctor and I actually have those. I was looking in my computer, fa- found the files. Uh, you, it was it, it was it was uh, they were interesting audios back then. Well, yeah. So I see you restrained yourself from praising them. Oh uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> not well. Hey, uh, all I can say is this: I have a picture of Nick Briggs as the mock doctor, and I said he was making bow ties look cooler way back yeah, before well, Matt Smith you know, even I'm even proud. touched it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had great fun doing that, uh, and uh, it was a very formative experience for me. Um, it's uh, you know I learned and honed quite a few skills while I was doing this because I used to do a lot of the um, post production, yeah. you know, uh, the editing and the sound design and music, and I really learned the skills that helped me to uh, work for Big Finish. So that when you know, and when Gary Russell and I, because we were working on it in the, for the final. Uh, season we were working together because we did four seasons full series and uh we said to each other when we finally sort of grew up and had to move on from spending all our waking hours making these things you know we had to move on and get proper jobs you know we had this pipe dream that one day we'd love to get a license from the bbc to wouldn't it be great said gareth we could do this with the, the the real doctors off the telly and you know so we always had that desire and then one day of course gary russell came around and had to have a cup of tea with me as he did many times in those days because we lived about five minutes walk from each other uh, and he he just said it's happened you know 
Jason and I have managed to get this license. So, yeah, it was a very important experience for me. And to be honest, I did like them. I did enjoy them. Yeah, they are what they are, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, they're what they are. Yeah. They're the training grounds for Big yes. Finish. Yeah. Real-time pictures uh, you used oh, yeah. to work for and you'd be in I all still those... work for real-time. Oh, you still work for real-time? Yeah, is still, real-time yeah. still there? Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. Yeah. They've got a site called Time Travel TV now. Give the URL, timetraveltv.co.uk. Do you know, I don't know, I don't know exactly what it is, but I can find out if I just look at a, an email from um, okay. Pete Barnfather, and I think he's probably got it at the bottom of his uh, emails. But, you, <laughs> but yes, you can get downloads of them now. You can get downloads of them, you can stream them. Uh, yeah, I, I've, seen, I've seen the site. TimeTravelTV.com. Time yes, travel, oh, dot .com. Okay. Yeah. So you were the host of The Myth Makers, a series yeah. of uh, made-for-video documentaries and you got to interview some of probably your most favorite people, Doctor Who actors. Yes. And stuff. Yeah. Who was your favorite to interview of all the oh, interviews well, you did? Because you did a lot. Yeah, I suppose you did. Uh, let me think. Um, favorite to interview. I can't, I don't do. I'm a bit like Colin Baker in that I don't do favorites. Right. I yeah. Do, yeah. I, I, I probably shouldn't have used the word favorite. I, no, I no, it's fine. said the most memorable. <laughs> in terms of enjoying it what goes in your sizzle reel yeah what goes in your sizzle reel from well interviewing colin baker for example was a real turning point for me because doing those videos was all about me wanting to sort of do performing work and not getting the chances to do it and someone gave me the chance to do it and i was quite nervous right. you know and i realized i don't know whether i realized at the time but certainly retrospectively that what i really wanted to do and this sounds a bit sad i really want to meet doctor who you know, I don't really want and the, the characters and really, you know, meeting the actors, there was always a, a sense of slight disappointment. And in those days, Doctor Who was really not cool at all. So getting oh, into don't don't Doctor you don't have to tell us that. <laughs> you yeah. don't have to tell us that. But getting them to talk about Doctor Who was really quite difficult because there was no I'm not saying there was no joy, but it was difficult to get that joy in them about it, all of them, because it was a slightly embarrassing thing, you know, um, for them. So some of the interviews I, I found quite a strain, really. And then when I did the one with Colin Baker, he was the first one, really, who had an unrestrained joy about his time on Doctor Who, which, uh, you know, some people might think is ironic. Given I was about that. to say, <laughs> ironic considering his, his departure. Yes, exactly. But he was, But of all the people I interviewed at that time, he was the one who embraced it most, had the most joy about it. And pivotal for me, which sounds a little bit egotistical, gave me credit for the job I was doing. So he his attitude was very much like you're the interviewer, you're in charge. You're, you know, and he did everything he could to help me. And we got on like a house on fire and he gave me a huge amount of confidence that I hadn't previously had doing those interviews and then uh, so I did uh, uh, then did an interview with Sophie Aldred and Sophie's my age so we got on she's my girlfriend by the way oh well there you go we solidified that we, 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 we've had her on the show before we, we solidified that we're together well she's a lovely human being she and is. you know and that, that was a lovely one to do but uh, also and I, I particularly liked the Mary Tam one Okay. Um, because uh, Mary is so lovely and so completely outrageous that she, um, before we were filming, she told me the truth about everything and then said, I'm not telling you any of that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, Lou Jameson as well. You know, I had a lovely time with her. I mean, you know, just to be controversial, I had a terrible time with John Pertwee. You know, he was you very. Know I, I've heard, trusted. I've heard stories that uh, that it, some people had difficulty interviewing John Pertwee. Yeah, well, he was just um, he was the opposite of Colin in the sense that uh, to interview, in the sense that uh, he gave you no credit for being able to do your job. Uh, I would go so far as to say that he gave the impression, and I'm sure this isn't what was actually going on in his head, but he gave the impression that he was looking for you to mess it up. He was constantly suspecting that I wouldn't be doing a good job. And he gave me no credit whatsoever for what I was doing. So he would, he would, I'd be asking a question yeah. and he would, he would just turn and talk to the director and say, I, I don't like this. Um, I want to talk about something else. You know, and he wouldn't say, hey, Nick, I don't, I don't want to do that. Could we maybe? No, it was straight over my head. It was a bit like, what's this imbecile doing? Now, having right. said that, um, 
you know, every time I subsequently met him after that, he was always absolutely delightful to meet. Mm -hmm. He was just um, quite vicious as a performer. If you were on stage with him, you were used by John on right. stage. You know, you were you were the whipping boy if you were the interviewer. He would slap you down and get a laugh out of it, but it would be a vicious a, yeah. it would be a vicious thing on stage, which looks funny. Um, you know, tragedy is close up from a distance. It looks funny. Tragedy looks funny in long shot, doesn't it? You know, it looks farcical. So when he told me to shut up in the middle of asking a question, that's funny to a huge audience. When you're standing <laughs> next to Doctor Who and he looks at you and <laughs> no. hates you and says, shut up, that's horrific, you know. But um, I, 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 I sympathise. I've been there. I've been there doing uh, panels you know with, I mean. uh, with some people. And, yeah, I just suddenly realised, oh, OK, um, I'm the straight man and I'm the victim in this. OK, I'll, I'll yeah. yes and, I'll go along. But, you know, just, when are you going to hit me with a cream pie, you know? It's, exactly, yeah. And there's nothing you can do to recover from that situation. And you no. just have to sort of sit there and take it, you know? Yeah, you got to yeah, sit there, you got to take it, and you got to act like you love it. Yes, yes. Well, I remember from another interview that John had is that I, from what I gathered from an interview that I saw a couple times, he saw this more role as a job than the kind of love and, 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 the, and the core basis of how you and I have fandom towards it. Because I remember, I think he said somebody had asked him, what did you feel the first time you met the Daleks? And he goes, uh, what time is lunch? I think when he was doing it at the time, he probably didn't understand the fandom that was out there. And I think he saw it as a job when he first started. Is that something that I could be wrong about? Or? Well, I, I would say this. I, that I think he poured a lot of uh, love into playing the part. And also... I've been realising more and more recently through re-watching that I think he did a phenomenal job. And that's not just a bit of PR nonsense from me. I thought he was a fantastic doctor, actually, and really underrated. He He's does. My bear... all... He is my all-time favourite. Yeah, he really bears a lot of re-watching. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it is, frankly, the best performance John Pertwee ever gave in anything, his portrayal of the Doctor, in my, in my humble opinion, obviously. But I think it was John Nathan Turner who, in some book or something, uh, summed up the different approaches of the Doctor. And the thing was that, you know, John Pertwee was, it seems to me, quite centred on his performance, not on the show itself. It was to do with him. And so, yeah, asking him about the Daleks, and he hated the Daleks, and to start with hated the Master, because these were things that took focus away from what he felt was the centre of the job. Oh, okay. It's a good extrapolation of his methodology. I but he was that. brilliant. And I say, as I say, you know, there, I mean, there's a lovely story I tell against myself, where after I'd had a particularly bruising experience with him at a convention, at the next convention I went to, the, the organiser said, oh, and Nick, you're going to be... Uh, interviewing John Pertwee, because that went so well. And I said, I'm not interviewing that expletive deleted. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, he's just horrible. I just, you know, it's not worth my time. So anyway, cut to a few hours later, I'm in the very, very crowded green room, you know, loads of people chatting. John Pertwee arrives at the door and everyone sort of turns around. There he is in his costume and he's talking away and I'm mumbling to friends next to me. Oh, look at him. Oh, no, no, so, and so I'm not interviewing him. And then John Pertwee shouts out across the room, oh, Nick, he says, and the crowd parts like the Red Sea to channel across the room from him to me. And he says, I hear you're doing my interview again with the big smile on his face. <laughs> and I turn around and look at him and I say, yes, that's right. <laughs> All my courage melts away. You know. it's, it's okay, Nicholas. I actually um, had an interview with Colin Baker at a convention. Oh, and yes. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I've, I've said this before beforehand, and I managed to get another actor's name wrong. And the this brothers, was my first... Right? What's that? It was from the brothers. It was from the brothers. Yeah. And he, throughout the interview, he kept on saying, oh, you mean like so-and-so. Oh, you mean like that so-and-so? And he would get, purposely get the name wrong. <laughs> and about the fifth time he mentioned it, I said, you're not going to leave me alone, are you? <laughs> and he just laughed. I was just like, oh, God. My, yeah, but I panicking. can see my idol just tearing me apart panicking. on audio. Uh, but, um, yes, I think, go, you see, Colin can tease quite viciously. Yeah. But, I mean, if you, if you put your hands up, he'll let you off the hook. I think the thing with John Pertwee is that he would never let you off the hook. Oh. You know? you, there wouldn't be that sort of... Uh, I remember the first, I think it was the first time I interviewed him for behind the scenes thing. I said to him, how are you enjoying the convention so far? In my funny little light voice, you know, and he said, 
I've just got here. And just looked at me like, you idiot. How can I enjoy it? How do I know? I've just this, you know, and all his mates all laughed in a kind of really harsh sort of oh. mocking way. And you could see. <laughs> oh, good one, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can see my little heart <laughs> break, you know, oh, God. as I scratch my nose for slightly too long, you know. <laughs> yeah, you can't punch the star, but you, you almost think you can get away with slapping around some of their entourage. <laughs> <laughs> they look quite tough to me. It's Terry uh, Walsh, of course. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Now, speaking of uh, Colin Baker, one of my first memories of you, Nicholas, we're going way back when, when I first saw you, the Air Zone Solution. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that one actually took my childhood and just killed it on sight because it was the first time ever I saw a doctor in bed with a companion and had yeah. to accept it as such. Well, let me tell you this. That was not in my script. I, <laughs> I did not write that. No? I, I did not write that. I wrote the opposite. I wrote that they were just friends. And Bill Baggs, he argued with me about it and said, no, I think they should be in a relationship. And I argued successfully not. And he seemed to agree with me, but he did what Bill always did, is he went off and he just filmed it the way he wanted. And I arrived on set and everyone was talking about this bedroom scene. And I laughed. I thought people were just, you know, people no, were just... No, my childhood just died on impact. <laughs> it was, it was and the hilarious thing, of course, is that... Um, uh, you see more of Colin than you do Nicola. <laughs> you see more of Colin's skin than Nicola's. I actually enjoyed Colin in it because he seemed like he was having a good time. Oh and yeah, he was the star of the show practically. So I was, I, I was, uh, I was enjoying it. But uh, how did that all come together? How, I mean, how did you get Nicola? How did you get the doctors all together to do that? Well, it was round about the time that the something anniversary of Doctor Who, I can't remember which, and there was uh, a thing called the Dark Dimension. 30th. You're talking about the 30th. Uh, it would have been 1993. Right. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's, it's all so long ago. I can't remember. <laughs> hey, um, you know, you're not that much older than I am, Nick, so let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's just say it right there. Okay, well, that's all right then. I feel better already. Well, when I was your age, well, I was your age. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so they were this thing, the dark dimension was was being sort of peddled around. And of course, it was just an incredible, as it turned out, it was just an incredible invention by the writer, Adrian Rigglesford, who managed to fool uh, some BBC people into thinking that it was being made. So they assumed it was. And then the moment someone actually asked for a budget code, the whole thing unraveled because it didn't actually exist as a production of the BBC. It's quite a feat of, um, yeah, subterfuge to have managed to almost or get it to the point where people were actually requiring a budget code. Um, but, yeah, so uh, all the doctors were asked to do it. And John Pertwee, Colin Baker, Peter Davison and Sylvester McCoy all turned it down because their parts in it were so small and rather tactlessly Tom Baker's part was much much bigger by several magnitudes and so when we first started rehearsing the air zone solution Colin Baker walked into the room with the script and he had the dark dimension script as well and he went and we were re rehearsing it at the uh, Acton Hilton as they call it the old BBC rehearsal rooms that Bill Baggs had managed to wangle some space in probably you know illegally and uh, and he waved to the dark dimension script around our mind and said do you know the difference between these these two scripts and I said no, thinking, oh, cool, what's he going to say? And he put my script down, pointed at it. He said, I'm going to do this one. And then oh! just dropped the dark dimension unceremoniously <sighs> onto the floor. So that's sort of how we did it. <laughs> well, well, we didn't hear about dark dimension in the US until like the mid 90s. It eventually going to trickle out. Again, you talk about these kids, about these pre internet days where. Well, well I, you know, unless you follow Doctor Who magazine and got. To... Even then, that was hard to find. Well, uh, I had a subscription, know. so whatever. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, the thing is, it never existed, so it's not, it's possibly not worth knowing about anyway. <laughs> That's true. But for a while, we thought it was. We got dimensions in time instead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm an EastEnders fan, so I appreciated it for what it was. The title's been rewritten, The Egos of the Doctor. <laughs> wow. Oh, but my But you know, goodness. the story about the Ezen solution is that after we started filming it, John Pertwee insisted on being in it. And Bill Baggs, he phoned Bill Baggs and said, I want to be in your, your film. And Bill said, oh, well, maybe we can work together on something else. 
And, and John said, no, this, I want to work on this because the other doctors are in it. And I think John was sort of doing it as a political statement. And so Bill Baggs phoned me up and we were already shooting the blooming thing. And he phoned me up and said, do you think that when they meet outside the house, there should be this other character? And I said, what? Uh, he said, you know, some like old guru who kind of taught them everything they knew. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, who will we get to do it? We could ask <laughs> Michael Wisher, I said, you know, knowing Michael and thinking he was going. He said, well, I was thinking more John Pertwee. And I said, well, there's no way John Pertwee will want to be in this. But he said, well, actually, the reason I'm phoning is because John Pertwee's insisting on being in it and I need you to write him a character <laughs> fast. So, yeah, I think I had about two days to do it and then went to the set, you know, and they had it all written on a big piece of paper for John Pertwee to read. And he and Peter Davison were doing a big scene. So, yeah, it was brilliant that he was in it. It's fantastic. You also worked with Colin and Nicola on The Stranger Stories. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and, and originally it seemed to be Doctor Who. I mean, it, it, it was, you know, The Stranger and uh, Miss Brown – if I remember correctly, <laughs> which, okay, I uh, wonder, that's kind of like the BB Audios BBV yeah. with Sylvester as the professor and Sophie as Ace or yeah. Alice, or which is that Alice is just an Ace with a lie in it. Yeah. Uh, they, they had to change it later because the of Domine, the... yeah, the Domine, which is Gaelic for the Doctor. But yeah. uh, that's another story. We're talking about the stranger. So you. you... It's more or less the same story. <laughs> that's right. So, it, it, but it changed and it got darker. Each stranger's story got darker. Can you tell us a little about working on The Stranger? Sure. The reason it changed is because uh, you're absolutely right that when Bill originally did it, his intention was just to do Doctor Who, but not call it Doctor Who to avoid being sued. So when he asked me to do it, I couldn't... I, I feel I'm not portraying myself as some sort of, you know, crusader for <laughs> truth and justice. <laughs> All it is that when you're Superman, writing Superman, ladies and gentlemen, we have Superman here on Krypton Radio. Wow. <laughs> How appropriate. Yeah. Oh, even better. We have Sherlock Holmes, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about that, that later. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> that later. For me, I don't know whether you'll sympathize with this, for me to write something with characters in, I can't write it unless I know who they are and the truth of them. And I can't write something where someone is the doctor, but you can't say he's the doctor and the TARDIS is just out of shot because you're not allowed to show it. So my first thing was I thought, well, when he asked me to write one, I'll have it that they've lost their memories. So they don't know who they are. So that's fine. So it had some integrity in the characters. You see what I mean? Because, you know, they, yeah. I hate that sort of thing where, where people can't say things for copyright reasons. You know, they either are what they are or they're not. So and then when he gave me the opportunity to write some more, I wrote an alternative backstory for them. And, you know, basically so that they weren't the Doctor and Perry. And, and we created new stories that way. But it's great fun to do. I mean, it's hugely great experience. I enjoyed those. So as being a Whovian, 1989, unfortunately, it goes away. It comes back in 1996 with Paul McGann. First of all, how did you feel about the movie? Because you use Paul like crazy in the Big Finish audience, <laughs> which I completely thank you so much oh, for. Yes. I love that thank you, you very fleshed much. out his doctor. Yeah. I love Dark Eyes. I loved uh, Prisoner of the Sun, which is still one of my favorite Paul McGann ones because it was really, really fun. We were talking earlier about Rob Sherman. One of my favorites is Scherzo, one of his. Oh, oh yeah, yes. Uh, tell me how you felt when 96 came in. It didn't get rebooted, and then how you came across Big Finish. And where did the title come from, out of curiosity? Oh, Big Finish is an episode title from a series that Steve Moffat created called Press Gang. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jason Haigellery has always been a fan of Steve's work and really likes it. It's sort of, it's, it was sort of a, a kid's series, but with an adult sensibility about it and really beautifully made. Have you ever seen it? Yeah, I've, I've seen a couple of the first episodes of it. Well, when Jason created a company, he wanted to use there was a there was another episode title from it he wanted to use, and I can't remember. But all I'm saying, for all I remember, Jason telling me is that that title sounded even more like pornography than Big Finish does. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, well, I never. Uh, oh, <laughs> I never oh, 
that way. That hadn't occurred to Jason at the time, obviously. Um, that uh, no, I mean that it obviously hadn't occurred to him. But the other title was already taken as a company name, so he opted for his second favourite episode, which was called The Big Finish. So that's where the title came from. What was the other question? Oh, I think you answered that. <laughs> where did it come from and where did you get the idea? Let's go ahead and continue on the series just oh, by a audio format. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, that's something that Gary and I always wanted to do. And Gary had known Jason since they were kids, really. And Jason was a successful businessman, so would have the financial wherewithal to, to get a license, really. So that's that's kind of how that came about. I mean, there's a much longer story there, but it's documented elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> And I think when you first started, you thought you were going to get Tom Baker, but you ended up with Paul McGann. Well, we thought that it was more likely that we'd get Tom Baker because Paul McGann seemed to be this, you know, this person who'd just done this one off thing. And we didn't know whether he'd have any connection with it at all. And also, you know, Paul McGann seemed like a movie star. And Tom Baker had, you know, done Doctor Who and a few other things, but it sort of, I don't know, it just seemed, yeah, it, it seemed more likely. But the opposite was true because Tom turned it down uh, in, a, in a very strange way that, you know, he, he, he received the uh, request officially and then we never got official responses from him. He just publicly said... <laughs> He wasn't doing it. You know what I mean? So it was a little bit oh. like... Uh, it, it'd be like the equivalent of uh, asking someone out on a date right. uh, by a personal message and then them going on Facebook and saying to the world, I am not going on a date with Nicholas Briggs. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was a bit like that. And I don't think Tom meant it in any particularly nasty way. Right. Just, I don't, th- you know... I think, he, I think he was just letting fans on know that, no, I, I'm not going to participate. But, yeah, I can, it'd be nice I, if I can sympathize for somebody who's made a pounds. public announcement. I'm not going out with him. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, Tom has since said that he, he doesn't know what was the matter with him and he wished he had said yes all those years ago now. So there you go. But, yes, it was quite a surprise to get Tom again. I mean, some scurrilous people have suggested that when Janet Fielding was his agent, that's when we weren't getting any, making any headway with uh, Paul McGann. And then when she ceased to be his agent and we contacted again, uh, suddenly the agent went, oh, yeah, that sounds like something he'd do. <laughs> so whether there's any... I know when Janet's been asked about that at conventions, she um, gets very tight-lipped and, uh, and um, slightly aggressive, although the term slightly aggressive pl- applied to Janet Fielding seems moderate. <laughs> I say this with love and affection because I love her very much and she's a lovely person and you know, does fantastic stuff for Big Finish. All right. We have to take a small break. When we come back, we will continue our interview with Nicholas Briggs here on Marku 42 on Krypton Radio. The voice of Christian Basil, take one. Hi, I'm Christian Basil, and I would like to provide my voice for all your voiceover needs, such as... Okay, like an announcer. Like a what? Like an announcer. For all your voiceover needs, such as animation, radio, announcements, introductions... Now an old man. I can even record voicemail for all the Meshuggahs that call you. A pirate. Arr, and it won't cost you a lot of treasure for me services. Arr. A creepy movie voice. Just call 407-761-2679. 407-761-2679. Or email voice of Christian Basil at yahoo.com. Well, how was that? That's a wrap. Me Grimlock, not podcaster. Me Grimlock King. Since 2011, we have been taking you beyond. That's right. Tooncast Beyond has covered many cartoon series and films in our four years online. Now we take you even further as we reformat the podcast by covering any and all cartoon series by season. And we also have our animated film reviews. So join TFG and Mike and the rest of the GCRM crew as we give you a different cartoon review every Wednesday on iTunes, Stitcher Smart Radio, Blog Talk Radio, and of course, GeekCastRadio.com. We are beyond good, beyond evil, beyond your wildest imagination. Attention all Whovians! While you're waiting for the new episode of Doctor Who... Start your own adventures with a book from Mark Who 42 Books. They carry unique and rare books at affordable prices. Visit Amazon.com slash shops slash Mark Who 42. That's Amazon.com slash shops slash Mark Who 42. Mark Who 42 Books. Set your imagination free into the Hooniverse. Uh, Sir Jarvis, is it that time? The house party protocol, sir? Correct. 
The Pull Bag is the GCRN's comic book review and discussion based podcast. Join your host, DFG and Mike, and the rest of the GCRN crew as we make our way through the comic book world. Inside the Pull Bag, you'll also find back issue classics, origins episodes, after darks, and so much more. You can find the Pull Bag every Wednesday in iTunes, on Stitcher Smart Radio, Blog Talk Radio, and of course, GeekCastRadio.com. Make your great escape into comics and jump into the Pull Bag today! Hi folks, this is Christian Basil, Mark Who 42 and if you've been lucky enough to catch us at conventions and wondered how you could hire us to come to your convention or special event, simply go to Heroes on Hand, click the podcast icon, and click the icon for Mark Who 42 On our page on Heroes on Hand, you can actually click the button that says click here to book Mark Who 42 for your next event, and that's all you have to do. Once again, if you wanted to hire us for your next event, event, simply go to heroesonhand.com, click on podcast, click on our icon, and click the green button to book us for your next event. You're going to love us. We'll see you there. Hello, this is Rob Shearman, and you're listening to Mark Who 42. And we're back with more of Mark Who 42 on Krypton Radio. We've got Christian Basil, we've got Kayla Ascalillo, and we've also got, as you've been listening, our special guest, Nick Briggs. Hey, Nick. Still there? Uh, I'm still here. Wow, that's good. Sometimes they bail on us, but good. <laughs> <It's here. laughs> so much confidence. Yeah, bye. In I mean, really. No, 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 no. After they get to know us, bye. <laughs> oh, no, no. We have a great relationship with our guests. So far. <laughs> so far, that's true. Nick, you have been doing the voice of the Daleks on Doctor Who since 2005 when it returned. How did you get the gig? It all started when I got a phone call. I think it was from uh, Clayton Hickman, who was the editor of Doctor Who magazine at the time. And he was the first of several people to phone me and say, listen, don't tell anyone I told you this. But I was at a meeting at the BBC of Doctor Who licensees and Russell T. Davis told us all about the new series of Doctor Who. He mentioned the Daleks and I said, I hope you're getting Nick Briggs to do the voice. And he said, yes, we are. But don't tell him yet because we haven't approached his agent. Several other people made the same call to me. So then I spent several months in agony, during which my you know, best mate, Rob Shearman, I don't know why I hesitated before I said best mate. He was my best man, so I suppose <laughs> he is my best mate. Um, it sounds awful. Uh, he, uh, Rob Shearman got to write the first Dalek episode, and all through him starting to write it, I was thinking, but I don't know whether I'm going to be the voice of the Daleks or not. Um, but eventually the call came from my agent who in those days hardly ever contacted me at all. That particular agent doesn't contact me now because he's dead. Nothing to do with me getting oh. the voice. There you go. And if he were to call me now, I'd be quite scared. Yeah, it would be um, scary. But, um... scary. You know, I, after this interview, Nick, I think from what we've had with other interviews in the past, I don't think anybody can keep a secret at the BBC if they try. <laughs> I don't know Is what it... you're suggesting. <laughs> um... Did you hear you're going to be a Dalek? Oh, I found out 10 days ago <laughs> that they were going to be a Dalek. So I got the job basically because Russell T. Davis saw me as a total solution. You know, he knew that I could do the Dalek voice because he'd heard me in Big Finish Productions, of which he was either a subscriber or certainly a regular buyer. So he knew all about them. As I discovered when he first phoned me and he started sort of quoting the stories he'd heard, and I thought, oh, you're a proper fan of Big Finish, aren't you? And also he'd read uh, a rather sad article I'd written in Doctor Who magazine all about how you technically did the Dalek voice. And, the, you know, and I mentioned I had a ring modulator and there was indeed a photograph of the ring modulator, which is the thing, the gizmo that helps you do the electronic side of it. And he thought, well, you know, there's no radiophonic workshop anymore. This guy's an actor. He can do the voice. And also he can bring the gizmo along as well because we don't have that equipment anymore. So, uh, yeah, I was a total solution package to the Dalek voice. Wait a minute, do you have this laying around the house right now? The modulator? Oh, no, no, we can't ask him that. I do, no, no. <laughs> I do but it needs to, it's it's a feat of engineering to... Oh, no, no. I... <laughs> it's not just something you pick up and talk into <laughs> like a and it comes out the other side, you know. I w wish I wish it were, but all sorts of things need to be done to the sound to get it sounding exactly like a Dalek. Unlike your video on your site, I would hasten to add. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I should do a version of that for you, shouldn't I? That you can use. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've done Daleks, you've done Cybermen, and then uh, I guess you've ran the gauntlet because you are, you also have the Jadoon, the Ice Warriors, the Nesting Consciousness. I yeah. think the Jagrafest and, and 
the Zygon. Yeah, I don't remember the nesting consciousness having a voice. I, I did. Yeah, well, I, I, heard, I remember. <laughs> I, I did a, that. I did a lot of that. I did a lot of that, and also they wanted it to say one word that wasn't in the script. Uh huh. And it was when they were editing Rose, and I'd already filmed Dalek and 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 parting of the ways as well. The dubbing people at BBC Wales contacted me and said, um, "Russell T Davis has said that you're the man to come to to do the Nestine voice." And I said, "What?" I think I'd already. Oh no, I hadn't seen the episode at that point. So I said, "Well." I don't know what you mean. They said, well, there's a bit... They put one more cut back to the Nestine consciousness in the edit than was in the script, and they want it to build, and they, the only thing they can think of to make it build sufficiently is if when they cut back to it again, it says something to the Doctor. So I don't really know what you mean. So they sent me a VHS tape of the first rough edit of Rose, which I've still got somewhere. It's quite different, actually, and uh, it's got all stock music on it and stuff. So it's, it was quite, it's not, historically quite an interesting thing to have. And I was, Let me say oh. something. We should let the younger viewers of our show know a VHS tape is a... <laughs> is, is a was he... <laughs> Kayla, a VHS tape <laughs> I'm not that young. <laughs> And it was like a cassette tape, but you probably don't know what a cassette tape was either, <laughs> because cassette tapes were from CD. What CDs were back? To, okay, never mind. Go back to your story. Go back hey, to your Mac story. Sounds cool. <laughs> it's, I can't tell you how thrilling it was to see that early edit of the first episode quite a while before it aired. Um, that was a real, oh, you know, lovely moment for me, just sitting alone in my flat watching this, thinking, I'm about to watch the first episode of the new Doctor Who. Anyway, um, so I went into a dubbing studio in London and just stood in front of an enormous screen that was seemed to me to be about the size of a house, watching all this blobby stuff, and just spent ages standing there going... <laughs> and then it had to say... They'd had selected three words it could say. I can't remember what they all were, but one of them was Time Lord, and that's the word that was used. But when I saw the first episode broadcast, I watched it, and I got to that bit, I couldn't hear it. No, I... I... Swear to God, I can't hear it either. Now, I, I, because I, I knew you put words in there. And well, what you need to do is buy the box set of that first series. Okay. Because all the sound was remixed differently for that. Oh, okay. You but, can hear it on the box. I don't set. know if you can hear it on BBC America when they play it. I, no, the broadcast version you can't hear it. But on the DVD, you can. On the box set version, the vanilla DVD is the same mix as the episode as broadcast. But interestingly, if you put the subtitles option on, yes, I am this sad, it does come up with a line. And when it when it comes up, you can sort of hear. Oh, God. Okay. But yeah, so it's hilarious that I was credited on it. Everyone <laughs> it was well done. But <laughs> you're credited in the first episode of the new Doctor Who. That that was a bit of thrill. Well, that was my mother's favourite part of the episode. <laughs> the fact that my, my name came up at the end, because in those days the credits moved slow enough for you to be able to see them. Yeah. <laughs> now today they just go flying off the screen. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you know, the last time that they forgot to credit me, I wasn't even sure that I hadn't been credited. I had to go back and freeze frame it. And I went, oh, no, no, they have forgotten the Dalek voice credit. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, no, oh. that's not good. You've also played the voice of the Jadoon uh, on Doctor Who. It's, it, it, you were also on Sarah Jane Adventures. Yes, that's right. I know you were just doing the voice, but did you get to actually meet Elizabeth Slayton? Well, I didn't actually uh, go on set for that. You but go on I'd, set. I'd met Liz many times before and worked with her on Big Finish, so I right. knew oh. her- True, true. That's right. That's right. The Sarah Jane Smith, the two series of audios that were on Big Finish. I remember those. But I, I sort of knew Liz anyway through conventions and uh-huh. stuff. So, you know, and we did a Myth Makers and spent two days together filming that. Do that you're doing again. Oh, for Bobo. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. That was yeah. fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's murder on the throat. <laughs> oh, God. oh, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I chose to do it like that. And now, ladies, if you've had trouble sleeping, listen to Nick Briggs do all of his wonderful voices from Doctor. (laughs) Are we having a record sale? I don't know if you've heard of this, Nick, but there's a YouTube thing going around. It's the Dalek relaxing. Of course, I heard it. (laughs) Everyone sends it to me. Yeah, it's hilarious, isn't it? Lose that every other day, just in case. 
It's really... I haven't seen that. I need to find it's that. Just, oh, really? It's just a Dalek <laughs> screaming, relax. <laughs> <laughs> you must relax. It was just, oh my God, it's hysterical. You got to come out with your own version. <laughs> so you did all the voices on Doctor Who, and then Russell was so nice to you, he gave you a part in Torchwood Children. Well, he bless him, he gave me the chance to audition for it. Oh, <laughs> you I had did, to audition. yeah. And he contacted me and said, uh, you know, I said, thanks for giving me the part. He said, I didn't give you the part, you got the part. He said, you know, we auditioned <laughs> quite a few people, and... Um, and you were the best. I said, but the others must have been dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, uh, no, he, he won't have that sort of negativity. And he said, no, no, you know, take the compliment. You know, you were really good. So bless him. Yeah. So what was it that like? was great fun to do. Well, what was it like yeah, being in the Hooniverse, but not necessarily in Doctor Who? Well, I mean, the bizarre thing for me was, of course, that at that time, because Doctor Who had ceased production for a while, the entire production team of Doctor Who was then making Torchwood. So I knew all the crew because, I, you know, to do all the other voices and even the Jadoon, actually, in Doctor Who, I used to be on set. It was just a sort of quirk of availability that I didn't go on set for the uh, Sarah Jane adventures. And so all these people who knew me as a guy who sat with the sound people with my headphones on doing voices off camera, suddenly they saw me, you know, on camera. And it was uh, it was it was a weird adjustment for them and for me, really. To be in that environment, but be the other side of the camera. It was great. We mentioned earlier that you have been the doctor in comic form and audio form. But you also, in a charity performance of the Dalek Master Plan, you also played the Dalek. That's right. Well, um, the um, director and producer and star, Nick Scoville, uh, asked me to do it. And I was previously going to do Evil of the Daleks, but I wasn't available, as it turned out. And uh, he said, would you come and do the Dalek voices for the Dalek Master Plan? And I, and I sort of said, well, I will if I, I, if I can make it. And he said, well, look, will this sweeten the deal for you? We've written it, so at the end, the Doctor apparently gets killed, and just for the last scene, he regenerates into a new version. And he said, how about all the Daleks are dead by then? <laughs> he said, how about you come on at the end as the uh, the doctor. And uh, I said, yeah, that's a done deal. And the way it was done in a very old-fashioned big theatre with, um, you know, all the different levels to it. So I was up in what they call the gods, looking right down at the stage from a long way up with two or three levels of audience below me, doing the Dalek voices and watching it all on stage. And then the moment the Daleks all blew up, I quickly had to dash all the way down the theatre and just <laughs> got into the wings to enter through the TARDIS just in time for my entrance. So uh, that was quite fun. And it was a lovely little scene. And it was an amateur performance, so it was quite fun to go on as a professional actor because um, I don't know how to say this without sounding like a massive arrogant oaf, but there's a difference between an amateur performance and a professional performance. And uh, when the audience is attuned to amateur performances, when someone comes on and who, has, who does it as a job, there's a slightly different level. And so it meant that every night I got the most massive reaction to absolutely everything I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, you know, like the, nice. the old pro I am, I pulled every trick out of the bag, you know. But one of the other actors said to me, is it necessary for you to get a laugh on every line, Nick? And you could tell as the performances went by how the audiences became more and more um, concentrated, proper Doctor Who fans. The first performance... I think it was just mainly a general audience. And they just thought, oh, it was this guy. And I got quite a nice reception. And then the second performance, I got a little patter of applause as I uh, walked on. And then by the, you know, the the next few performances, I got almost standing ovations. I thought you were going to say that. Because I thought, oh, my God, it's him. <laughs> Nick, what is your love for Doctor Who? Why do you love this show so much? And as Doctor, I, I mean, I can see for myself, but what I wanted to hear your answer. What is your love yeah, for well, Doctor Who? What I was going to say before you... You qualified the question. I was going to say it's all consuming, but uh, I suppose there's a little bit of room for the prisoner in there. Um, but uh, <laughs> don't worry, we're not forgetting number six. Don't worry, he's not a number. It's a free man. I, I am. Um, it's difficult to define. It's like when people say, "Can you define why Doctor Who is successful?" It's just something that bit me when I was very, very young, and is just 
in me and it's all the things that everyone says that you know it was it seemed to be able to take you everywhere narratively and uh, i suppose you dreamed that you know you could be involved in that kind of thing fictionally be involved in it and it just had an attraction to me and it's just most people have something from their childhood that they can't quite let go of. Hopefully, they're relatively healthy things. For some people, of course, they are, and they're in institutions. Well, uh, but, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. well you know, could... for me, it's Doctor Who, and I, it bit me. In my sister, or they're listening um, to our show. <laughs> I didn't listen to our show. Thanks. <laughs> You're in trouble. I probably got to hear that was the sound. Yeah, so does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, you, you're you're kind of living a life that we want to... Uh, we love Doctor Who just as much. We are doing this show because we love Doctor Who. We love the differences that each Doctor brings to it, yet it's the same Doctor. The story, it really can take you anywhere. It's an anthology, but it's not. I mean, Twilight Zone was an anthology, and the thing that was holding it together was Rod Serling doing his little narration. But Doctor Who... It, it, it's an. It can go to any planet, be any kind of story, a comedy, a drama, a romance. Now we love this show so much, and that's why we bring Mark Who Forty Two to our listeners. I think that sums it up perfectly. Really, the fact that yeah, and Doctor Who can change and be many, many things. And you know, as each new person comes to write for it or run the show, you know, it can it can transform totally in flavor. And you know, yeah. it's it's remarkable like that. But it is really 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 difficult to define it's just you know you love it because you love it really speaking of transforming going back to the fact that you got to see the william hartnell last season what did you think when william hartnell changed into Patrick well i remember crying when i realized that william hartnell was going to leave but that's because children don't like change and uh, right. I remember, uh, yeah, well, and, I, and there was a program on BBC One for kids called uh, Junior Points of View. And it was all about people writing in and saying what they thought of television programs. And I remember the presenter saying, so is Doctor Who dead? And they showed William Hartnell there with his face sort of all glowing. I remember it like he was sort of writhing around and sweating. But obviously, you know, you remember these things slightly over dramatically. <laughs> and I remember, you know, saying to my mother, you know, is, is, is Doctor Who going to die? And she... You know, my parents always tried to make me give up Doctor Who. That's another important thing, isn't it? I'm I'm astounded now when I meet people like Tom Spilsbury, the editor of Doctor Who magazine. You know, his parents are Doctor Who fans. They love Doctor Who. And he was encouraged to like it when he was a kid, whereas my parents fought me all the time. They kept, they kept trying to sort of arrange for us not to be in when Doctor Who was on and stuff like that. But anyway, I was so I was quite um, uh, appalled that there was going to be a new Doctor Who. But as people often say, you know, it took me sort of about five seconds to love the new Doctor Who, you know. Oh, he's the Doctor now. Brilliant. You know. Well, if I could interject what I, I was about to say earlier. For me, the Doctor was... I grew up in a world with Marvel and DC and Transformers and G.I. Joe. And here was this hero by himself who didn't need muscles, who didn't pick up a gun. Well, unless you're Colin Baker eventually. But um, <laughs> when... When uh, <laughs> or Peter Capaldi, or or even um, Capaldi, or even yeah. Peter Davison, Matt Smith held held the gun. I think. Yeah. Oh well, did, uh, yeah, did very right. well with it. <laughs> hey, you can't Mercy. get away with remarks like that in front of Doctor Who fans. <laughs> yes. Too much but detailed knowledge. He was a hero when I grew up with Tom Baker. Not only did he use his intelligence and his skill, but he had a wit about him that he could go into the face. I I just love it when there was the retort between the Doctor and the bad guy. You know, Chop Suey, the Galactic Emperor. That was still one of my favorite lines and yeah, some of my yeah. favorite memories over there. So that's the thing I get from Doctor Who. Here was this hero that I kind of related to because he didn't need a brawn. He didn't need a sword. He didn't need muscles. He just went in there, did his thing, and he made it look good. Yeah, in a word, it, it's, it was unique. You know, there weren't other programs like that. You're absolutely right. All the other shows I liked were things that, you know, yeah, were, had more traditional heroes in them you know i was i remember being massively into tarzan you know the ron ely series and uh, and all, all the Owen allen stuff as well 
you know. So you were asked to come back for the Lego Dimensions game. How did that come about? Um, well, they, uh, they obviously contacted my agent. But yeah, that, the people at BBC Worldwide spoke to me and said, you know, we'd really like uh, Dalek and Cyberman voices in this to be authentic ones. So I actually uh, recorded them uh, in my bedroom. <laughs> wow. Hey, I record exactly. this for my bedroom yes. too. You, you too yeah. could be. <laughs> I, I could be on Legos. I could, I could have a voice in Legos. But my, was... my bedroom's in um, uh, a, a loft conversion, and if that makes any sense to you, and uh, it's got a sort of so there's a there's a corner part behind a clothes rail where the ceiling slopes, and the acoustics are really lovely there. So it's a little bit. It's not a studio, but it's got a very dead acoustic. So I can do all sorts of you know. Uh, proper recordings there i often record podcasts there myself so uh yeah so uh, w- what happened was they wanted to have a conversation with me i think on skype or facetime i can't remember which who cares it was talking on a computer initially they <laughs> they thought that maybe they wanted me to be uh, uh talking to them while i was doing the recording as if we were in a studio together and i thought oh i hope they don't want to do that because i just want to get on and do it you know and uh, I don't really want someone over Skype saying to me, oh, could that exterminate be a little bit more angry? <laughs> yeah. But I was quite relieved when I spoke to them that they, they were kind of hoping they wouldn't have to do that either. And, I said, and they said, and if you want us to talk you through it, and I said, do you know, I said, if you're happy, I'll just go upstairs now and do it and then send it to you and you write back to me and tell me what you want me to change, you know. Uh, so that's... That's the way we did it. It was it fun to do, you know. And But that's not the way you do it in Big Finish, because being an executive producer and directing a number of stories, you don't do them in your bedroom. You've got several studios around. That's right. Well, but I mostly go into the studio and interact with the rest of the cast uh, to do it. There are rare occasions when there's a Dalek story that I haven't written or directed <laughs> where I'm sometimes not available because I'm doing, I don't know, Sherlock Holmes or something else at the time. And uh, so in though, on those occasions, I will have recorded them in my bedroom. <laughs> oh, real? so you do? Occasionally, okay. yeah. <laughs> It'll be a shrine. Kind of like here in America, there used to be signs everywhere, like George Washington <laughs> slept here. Well, we have Nick Briggs was a Dalek here. We'll be yeah. plastered. Nick Briggs on- exterminated here. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, yes, there you go. Certainly one way to work from home. Oh. Yes. <laughs> this is the wonder of the internet, though, isn't it? <laughs> okay, you just brought up Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> and I... Oh, yeah, I did just bring up I'm Sherlock quite good Holmes. at self promotion. Yeah, he is, and and so are we. And Mark Who Forty Two Books, which is a, a is my little company, sells Big Finish audios at conventions. Are you going to be selling any of the Sherlock Holmes one? Not at the next one, but I am going to pick some up, and we will be selling some That's Sherlock the Holmes. Right answer. I've listened to a few of them. I've listened to season two of it. I've listened to the Tangled yes. Skein, and I liked it. I, you do a great Sherlock Holmes. You, Thank you. You, you, the, you can really believe that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had written it, but he hasn't. Do you write original Sherlock Holmes uh, for Big Finish, or are they all taken from Arthur no, Conan Doyle? No, we do uh, both. So that one you're talking about, the it was adapted from a book by uh, a very renowned Sherlock Holmes fiction writer called David Stewart. Davis and our friend Richard Dinnick, and this is why I listened to it because we interviewed Richard three years ago, and so I, I wanted to do some research. Richard did a really good, you know, straight adaptation of the book. The yeah. book was very much in a sort of dramatic form, anyway, so he was able to very easily adapt it. And um, yeah, so that one is uh, that actually has Dracula in it. That one, yeah. It, and 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 what was weird to me is because Arthur Conan Doyle, when something seemed supernatural, it wasn't. I mean, it, it, Sherlock Holmes was, you know. Know, like Hound of the Baskervilles, the whole thing is it's supernatural, and then there's an explanation for it. Tangled Skeen had Dracula. There was no explanation. And I thought that was a cool idea to use on Sherlock Well, Holmes. it was, you know, David who wrote the book, he, you know, he suggested an adaptation to me. And I, I thought, well, why not? But we've done lots of, you know, more traditional ones. We've done Hound of the Baskervilles and The Final Problem. And, but we've now, we, we are doing all new ones, really. And the, I'm about to, in March, I'll be recording a box set called The Sacrifice of Sherlock Holmes, which is, uh, uh, and we've been doing the, this will be the third box set we've done. 
uh, the ordeals of Sherlock Holmes and the judgment of Sherlock Holmes are the previous two. And it's just, it's one of my favourite things to do, actually, play Sherlock Holmes. I, funnily enough, the first time I played him was in 1999, and I was doing it as a, I was doing The Speckled Band, uh, a theatre production of it in London, and I was doing that during the day, and... Um, well, I was rehearsing that during the day, and in the evenings, I was editing The Sirens of Time, which is the first big finished Doctor Who <laughs> story that I wrote and directed. So I was doing the editing and sound design and music for that in the evening. And then during the performances, I, of course, I was doing that during the day. So it, was all, it all happened at the same time. And then later on, I was given a chance to do another theatre production of Sherlock Holmes, a couple of, actually three, yeah, I did th- two plays, and then I did a tour of a brand new play called uh, A Study in Fear. So, yeah, I've had a long association with him, and, yeah, it's, it's been great fun. I suppose it's the nearest I'll get to playing the Doctor. <laughs> well, but, again, we've mentioned... You well, yes, yes, that. but professionally. Yeah. These are professional <laughs> engagements professional. for Sherlock Holmes. Besides doing Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who and Benny Summerfield, Big Finish does a lot of stuff, and you can go to bigfinish.com. These are available for downloads now, yeah. or you could buy them from me at conventions, and I'd I'd prefer you do that. But you know, you can always go to Big Finish. Uh, no, but you've got a lot of different franchises now as part of Big Finish. You've got Terra Hawks, Jerry Anderson's Terra Hawks. You've got Blake Seven Survivors. Did you just do a Day of the? Yeah, Trivets? it was Night of the Trivets. The, the, the official sequel. Yeah. Sapphire and Steel. I love Sapphire and Steel. Love the original. Love your version. The one, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention this because you don't have the contract yeah. anymore. Tomorrow People. Well, we don't have the contract for Sapphire and Steel anymore either. Oh, you don't have it for Sapphire and Steel? But you can still sell the Sapphire and Steel. You can't sell the No, Tomorrow we can't. People. We don't sell Sapphire and Steel anymore either. Oh, I I was not aware of that. But to know, yeah, the Tomorrow People, we would love to do that again, you know, especially since the TV series has stopped again. I mean, the reason we we lost the license for it was because they were trying to sell it as a TV series, so they didn't want to renew our license. But the TV series wasn't the Tomorrow People. Well, you may say that. I couldn't possibly comment. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we're doing House of Cards here. And wait a minute, if I can add, uh, Mark Gatiss' Dracula? Has that come out yet? Uh, no, that's coming out. That's coming out. Okay, so yeah, be on the um, lookout for that as well. Actually, I can't remember when it's coming out. I'll just look. I think I've got. <laughs> uh, yeah, you do the research too. Yeah, but you can find uh, out on BigFinish.com. It's coming out in May, and May is special because the David Tennant, Catherine Tate Doctor uh-huh. News are coming out in May too. Yeah, you guys, I can't believe you got. You were finally able to get the new series, and you've got Units with Gemma Redgrave and Ingrid Oliver. You've got the Jadoon appearing in Big Finish now. Strax showed up with Jiggo and Lightfoot. Oh, my God. You've got so many great things in Big Finish. But the one I want to focus on right now, and this is your baby, you, Nicholas Briggs, got the prisoner. I did, yes. It's totally yours. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's Big Finishes. But you wrote it. You directed it. You, you got the license for it. Tell us about your love for The Prisoner. Oh, well, I've, I've loved The Prisoner. I, I first saw it when it was uh, first repeated in 1977. Of course, it was broadcast in 1967. Coincidentally, it started on my sixth birthday. There you go. I found out more recently that was the first broadcast date. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, and I had a fascination for it. it was, my father told me about it long before I saw it, you know, possibly 10 years before I saw it, actually. So when I finally caught up with it, I thought, this is this thing my dad was telling me about. And uh, I really loved it. And I did, I recorded the audio of it off television because in those days we didn't have video recorders. If you'd right. like to explain to people what video <laughs> recorders are. Video recorders play the VHS tapes that we're talking about before. Okay. Yeah, so, as uh, as, as Capaldi says it, Google it. <laughs> Google it. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so I was talking to ITV about the Jerry Anderson series about five or six years ago, you know, things like Thunderbirds and Stingray. And I kept mentioning The Prisoner to them. And when it turned out that because of the new series, Thunderbirds Are Go, it wasn't really the right time for us to do audio Thunderbirds. Um, And they said no. But uh, yes, they said to me when we couldn't uh, do um, 
uh, Thunderbirds, they said, look, is there any, they could see the disappointment writ large on my face. And they said, oh, is there anything else we can do for you? I said, well, the prisoner, and they kind of scratched their chins. And I said, you know, that I've been talking about for the last six years. And they went, oh, oh, okay. And so we um, <laughs> quite quickly, you know, they just made sure of the right situation. And um, we quite quickly secured a deal. And, and I must say that they've been absolutely, ITV, who are the owners of uh, the prisoner, have been absolutely fabulous to work with, really lovely people. And uh, we just, you know, uh, they they liked my plans for it and approved that all along the way. And, and uh, we had a fantastic time doing it. And luckily, you know, as you mentioned to me earlier, you know, I, I was quite, um, I, I had a lot of trepidation about whether people would like it or not. Because, you know, if you think that Doctor Who fans are proprietorial, imagine Prisoner fans, they've only got 17 oh, episodes yeah. to worry about. So... Uh, and there, and there was largely a quite negative reaction online to the announcement that we were doing it. People asked quite rightly, what's the point of this? And, you know, I'd, I'd be no good pitching a, a big series to uh, um, TV execs because I can't actually tell you what the point of doing The Prisoner is. I just know <laughs> that it had to be done and that I had to do it. And, uh, and luckily, everyone seems to have got it in the sense of understanding it and love it. And uh, we've had almost universally brilliant reviews. And um, I'm so pleased with the way it's turned out, not least because of Mark Elstob. Oh, yeah. Mark Elstob, you close, well, you don't have to close your eyes because it's audio, but if you close your eyes, you really see Patrick yeah. McGowan. The voice is is so yes, similar. It's not, it's not an impersonation, it but it, like... it, it captures, I know that. I know. I've yeah, heard his it, real voice. Yeah, it's it captures. It captures some of the essence of it, and it works, you know, because I wrote the character as the character as played by Patrick McGowan. You know, I didn't sort of change the nature of him. I didn't sort of, you know, right. decide that he was Scottish and only had one leg or something, you know. Well, you mention in the behind-the-scenes stuff on the, on the Prisoner CD set, you mention the fact of the audio vulnerabilities yes. because Patrick McGowan, when he did The Prisoner, he was always strong, he never buckled under and everything. But there were face yes. ticks, there were movements that made him second, that you could see he was second guessing yeah. or, or maybe not sure of something. And you can't do that on audio. So you made Elstob's part have vulnerable yes. nature. There, there are elements of vulnerability that. in it vocally. As you quite rightly say, in the original series, vocally, it, I don't think number six ever said anything that suggested any kind of weakness or doubt, but it was in his eye. And there were those moments yeah. when he was defeated, but he never said anything about it. And you better be bringing back number nine. <laughs> you write her back in there somehow. <laughs> Clone or not, you bring back number nine. I make no promises. <laughs> oh, but you make no definite decisions either. Your listeners won't know what you're talking about. In the first few episodes that I've done, I'd, in the originals, because uh, three of them are adaptations, but very broad adaptations of the original episodes, um, there are female characters. And, of course, it was the 60s, so quite often he would just be given some female character, you know, who was perhaps not as well-defined as they might be as a, a real human being. And, and I suddenly thought, well, how, what about if these female characters, what if they were the same female character and she could be in several episodes? And that would give an interesting foil. It's not like the Doctor and a Companion or anything like that, but there is another character for him to for us to appreciate his experience of the village through. Um, so um, that worked quite well, I thought. And, uh, and Sarah Powell, um, who played the part, was just brilliant. And she did it with a Caribbean accent. She's a black actress. Yeah. You know, and she, uh, uh, I, I thought it was inspired what she did, actually. And so many people, people who are not fans of The Prisoner, but who've listened to it, have really said, oh, God, I love number nine. You know, I don't know who that yeah. aggressive shouty man is, but I love number nine. <laughs> you were part of the Five-ish Doctors reboot. How were you asked to join that? Um, I think I was, uh, I was at the um, Royal Albert Hall, which is an, an enormous venue in London, and we were doing uh, the Doctor Who proms, and Peter Davison was presenting it. And in one of the breaks, he came over to me and said, Nick, I'm doing this video for uh, uh, the BBC. And I was aware that he'd started it off as a sort of, 
just a fun thing that wasn't official. And I, because I'd been on a convention tour with him in Australia and he'd been filming bits for it then. Uh, and he said, yeah, you know this thing I'm doing? Well, there's a bit, uh, I want some Dalek operators. And I went, oh, well, you need to speak to Barnaby Edwards or, or Nick Pegg. And he went, no, 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 I want you. And, I, but I, and he said, no, anyway, I want you to play a Dalek operator. I said, but I don't do the Dalek. And he said, I know, but I don't. We need to play the part of the Dalek operator. <laughs> we get it, man. Get it. You're a Dalek operator. <laughs> so um, he got me in, and uh, and it was a fantastic day's filming with uh, David Troughton, who I know pretty well from working with uh, over the years. So, it was to, and also Frank Skinner, who's a, a big uh, comedy star in the UK. Uh, you know, he's in lots of TV shows all the time. You know, hosts quiz shows and yeah. things and, a great, and I've always been a great fan of his and it turns out that he's quite a fan of mine which is quite funny for me meeting someone who I regarded to be incredibly famous and I'm sure he had his tongue in his cheek a little bit when he said Nick he said the reason I said yes to this job was to meet you and I laughed he went no seriously he said because you permeate every area of Doctor Who and he said you know I was listening to Dark Eyes the other day and I went what you know my jaw hit the floor and he's a big fan of Big Finish, which is why I got him to be in Dark Eyes 2 there and then. I said, I'm just doing the sequel, actually. Would you like, I've written a part that's a cameo part, and I'm trying to find someone famous to play it. Would you do it? And he went, I would love that. You know, so he was straight in to do that. So it was a, it was a lovely experience doing it. And Peter was very funny as a director because he's... Uh, Peter uh, doesn't like to be directed very precisely. He likes you to let him get on with it. And one of his complaints in the past about me is that, you know, I'm sort of giving him acting lessons when he doesn't really need them, which is true because he's a brilliant actor. Uh, but uh, it's hilarious when he's directing. He's exactly like that. He's completely, no, no. I had to do this thing where I had to uh, rattle a door. And he was so precise about exactly how I should rattle the door. And he kept impersonating my lines as well. Uh, he said, oh, and I kept saying, so am I playing this as Tony Hancock then, Peter? Because every time he did one of my lines, he sounded like he was doing a Tony Hancock impersonation. He's a very famous comedian, comedy actor from the 60s. I don't know whether he knew that. <laughs> Terry Nation wrote for Tony Hancock. There's a whole Doctor Who link. Oh, I have a bunch of uh, DVDs with Tony Hancock. So it was great fun to do. And uh, and, a, and a light fell on um, David Troughton's head and, and, and cut him. <laughs> I remember leaving with David Troughton, with people very tactfully trying to staunch the flow of blood from David Troughton's <laughs> head. And he was going, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. You can see all the BBC people thinking, God, we're only doing this as a laugh and we've injured someone. <laughs> Now, we're coming close to the end of this interview. I wanted to talk about some films that you were in that were directed and written yeah. by Noel Clark. You did Adulthood, which was the sequel to Adulthood. And you also did 4321. Yeah. Tell us a little about working with Noel Clark, the aspiring filmmaker. Well, yeah, Noel has done extremely well. He's a very, very talented man. I met him on the set of Doctor Who, you won't be surprised to learn. He was actually on the set of Parting of the Ways. Uh, where I didn't have any interaction with him on the production, but um, we uh, we were sort of around in Cardiff at the same time and staying in the same hotel. And um, I think one night we were taken back to the hotel from the unit in the same car. So we just made conversation. And I can't remember whether it was there or back at the hotel, but he's a very um, upfront, straightforward person. And he just said to me, uh, Briggsy, you and me are going to be friends. Give me your phone number. <laughs> and I, I did. And he typed it into his phone. And, you know, we've never looked back since. I haven't seen so much of him recently because we're both so ridiculously busy on things. And we're, I think last year was characterized by about five or six attempts for us and Benjamin Cook, who writes for Doctor Who magazine and is a, a, a YouTube phenomenon, um, all the three of us like to go out for lunch. And I think we had about five or six abortive attempts at arranging a lunch date, where, and always one of us wasn't available to do it. I did bump into him at a convention, I think the year before last, and uh, he commented on how I was never available. <laughs> he seemed quite cross with me. But bless him, you know, he, when he wrote his Torchwood episode, he wrote a part for me, and uh, I was only not in it because the part got edited out. But oh. in all the storylines, he showed me, he, he, he put, 
he named the character and put in brackets to be played by Nicholas Briggs. <laughs> and, you know, and bless him, he phoned me when the script editing stage cut that character out. He said, you know, he phoned me up to apologise and said, look, you, you know, I'm so sorry. They they think they don't need the character. That happens sometimes. That's happened to me before on some productions where I've got a part and then the, the actual part is removed. <laughs> they don't really cast it. They just wow. decide they don't need it for the narrative. You're, if you talk to actors, a lot of them will tell you that that happens from time to time. Or, or maybe they won't confess to it the way I've just done. <laughs> um, and, but Noel said, you know, uh, he said, uh, you're going to be in all my films. Uh, of course, that can't be completely true because I'm, you know, not castable in all of his films, but bless him. Yeah, he got me in those two. And I had a great time doing it. The story I tell about uh, uh, adulthood is that all the way through the editing process, he would keep saying to me, uh, you're still in the film, Briggsy. You're still in the film. I haven't cut you out. Eventually I said, listen, no. In that scene, the main character gets sacked from her job. That is the catalyst for everything else to happen in the film. And I know you shot it on a two shot. You can't cut me out of that film. <laughs> you don't have any coverage. <laughs> you know, there were no close-ups of her. You know, they couldn't have done it. So I had to be in that film, in spite of everything. Ooh. And then four, three, two, one. Yeah, I, um, that was that was an amazing uh, day on that. It was great. Yeah, and that was it. Uh, we filmed that at Pinewood. You know, so there I was in this massive, brilliant, famous TV studio. Uh, uh, well, sorry, film studio. Uh, film studio. Well, but they, they certainly did, did, yeah. Did. But uh, yeah, so I, I can't tell you how grateful I am to Noel for for getting me in those movies. It's great to have them on my CV, and it was great experience and and fun working with him. You know, he's a really nice guy, and you know who I, you know, who I'm great friends. Uh, yes, Nick, this is a part of the show where we allow our guests to allow. plug away, and you said you're good at that, so go for it. <laughs> where do you well, want to start? <laughs> Tell people what they can look forward to this year at Big Finish. Where do I start? <laughs> we need another ah, show for that. that. <laughs> There's loads more of the War Doctor coming up, and we had the most fantastic time yeah. working with John Hurt. We haven't at the moment got any sort of huge secrets to keep from you <laughs> about things coming up it's all laid out there of course i am working on the second series of the prisoner but that won't be coming out until january 2017 did i forget to mention the avengers yeah the avengers i'm just writing an episode of that one of the mrs peel episodes actually oh right they're doing the adaptation of the graphic the, the, that's the right. comic books yeah. uh not the comic yeah. strip stunt books comic strip. that's right yeah so i'm adapting yeah. one of those at the moment the guy who's playing steed is just great he's brilliant isn't he i mean and he's not like the original oh he's not patrick McGee in any shape way, way shape or form but the character does. and done something really beautiful with it and you sort of you buy into it straight away and emma peel is, is brilliant as well um yeah so what else uh, i'm also writing a third doctor story uh, which hasn't been publicised yet. So we're doing more of those Third Doctor adventures with Tim Trelaw doing the, the voice of the Third Doctor, uh, with Katie Manning in it. And, and here's a, uh, this is my suggestion: drop the narration. Just let him play the Third Doctor. He, he does it well. We're doing that. The only reason oh, we put the narration in is because we thought people wouldn't like it. Some people wouldn't like the idea that someone else was playing the Third Doctor. So we wanted them to have the get out in their mind that it was the narrator doing the voice. But nobody okay. has, you know, everyone's bought oh, into yeah. what he's done. And so we're just doing that. Okay. Thank you. Mark Who 42 fans, it was my <laughs> suggestion that made it happen. It's coming out. Without the narration. Thank you. I'm, it's, yours. I'm... it's yours and everybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> and you're all right. And we didn't want to do the narration in the first place, but we just thought we better had. And so it's one of those happy things that we were all, we're all on the same page. No one, no one has written in and said, you must keep that narration. It's the best thing about it. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm doing that. What else am I doing? I'm... Um, I'm writing a Tom Baker one. I'll also finally, hopefully, be finishing the writing the second series of Charlotte Pollard, who's the Eighth Doctor and Sixth Doctor companion who we spun off into her own series, and hopefully be recording that this year. And also I'll be working on some of the H.G. Wells adaptations we're going to be doing uh, 
uh, which hopefully will be coming out next year. So 2017 is going to be good. Yeah, yeah. And 2018 and 2019. And, and also the, the Cyberman series I did, uh, the Cyberman and Cyberman right. 2, that is going to be re-released in a box set because a lot of them have gone out of print. I will be and we're going to re-release them in uh, in a box set with both series in the box set. So at the moment, I'm working on a, a little featurette to go on those to give it some, you know, extra interesting content for people. Dalek Empire. Dalek Empire. We've got soft plans, as it were, for doing another series of Dalek Empire. All right. And at some point, I think we will re-release those in a box set, but we've not got any concrete plans for that yet. Now I've noticed the first. 50 ongoing series, Doctor Who ongoing series, are only available now on download? Are they all not available? I looked on the site I, when I was doing my ordering, and I, I just saw download, 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 download. Yeah, it looks like it's pure download now. Yeah. You sold out. That's good. Well, yeah, we finally stopped repressing <laughs> them. Yeah, Mark bought the rest. <laughs> I think. <laughs> We we finally stopped repressing them because of uh, storage space. And also, it's just, you know, uh, they end up selling in such small numbers that it's not. And, of course, when you repress, you have to repress a certain number. Otherwise, it's not financially viable. And so we made the decision to uh, not repress them. Whether they'll be re-released in a different form physically, I don't know at the moment. But uh, that's certainly something that we might look into in the future. Sorry, I'm sounding like a businessman now, aren't I? <laughs> well, but that, that, that's all right, because you are partly a businessman. Yeah, I mean, who knew that I'd have to do this grown-up job? You know, a lot of my time <laughs> a lot of my time is taken up with meetings, you know, meetings about websites and marketing and productions. You know, so for those of you who think I'm just living the dream, there are, you know, there are those, there are loads of wonderful moments where I'm sitting and writing dialogue for the third doctor, the fourth doctor, writing dialogue for the prisoner, going into the studio, hearing all this come to life, meeting all the great people, meeting, you know, uh, John Hurt. Rub it in, rub it in. <laughs> Uh, having a fantastic time with David Tennant and Catherine Day, all those things. Oh, that's all I'm lovely. But then, and then that's living the dream. That's living the dream. Thing. You were trying to say that you but aren't living the dream. Right. There are two things I would say, you know, to make you feel better about that. <laughs> one, one is that there's a hell of a lot of administration and stress and strain and, you know... Um, oh, good. Te- Red tape. Good. Te- work, all that goes into... The other thing I'd really like you to know is that before all this happened... You know, I did live in abject poverty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I I spent a lot of time meandering around. Yeah, especially when I was doing things like uh, the Stranger and the original Myth Makers. Uh, you know, and I look back and I, uh, yeah, think things were a bit tough for me. He said, and I can just cue all the very small violins playing now. So, you know, <laughs> what, what I'm trying to say, uh, sounding like a boring old fart, is that I, uh, you know, I worked long and hard for this stuff to come about. I'm not always working in the right direction, but eventually I was lucky and I put in a load of work as well. So, you know. That's the story of this show. Yeah. Vic, you definitely <laughs> deserve uh, a round of applause, and but we're not going to give it to you. It's the story of any creative <laughs> No, event. no, no. Isn't it, though? It's the story of any creative endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. Hardly anyone just kind of flips a coin and suddenly something brilliant happens. Occasionally it does, you know. Occasionally. Occasionally someone entirely talentless can go on a talent show and become world famous, but uh, it doesn't happen every day. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody out there who's interested in everything that we've just discussed over pretty much, what is the 90-minute show now? <laughs> it's close to 90 It's going to close to 90 minutes uh, on this show Definitely go to bigfinish.com. If you're interested in purchasing Big Finish audio at our conventions, make sure you're checking out Marku42 on Facebook or Marku42.net, where we're going to announce where we're going. We have announced where we're going and where we're going to be selling Marku42 books and bringing the Big Finish audio with us. You definitely want to check out this wonderful, incredible Whovian of a man, NicholasBriggs.com. And everything that's upcoming, and you're on stage, right? You're you're going to be doing some performances out there. Um, I'm going to be directing my uh, stage adaptation of uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, I'm directing that for a national tour around the UK. Uh, that will start in uh, May, and it'll be going to many of the big theatres in in the UK. Yeah, so I'm, I'm working on that, you know, in April. So that's going to be great fun. Cool. Well, Nick, I want to thank you so much for 
coming on in our show and uh, talking with us for this over an hour uh, well, interview. I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> this is a workout. <laughs> this is a mental workout after a while. <laughs> so once again, thank you. Uh, folks, don't forget, go to our Facebook page, Marku42. Tweet us at Marku42. You can listen to us on Krypton Radio. Hopefully you're doing that now. Or you can download us at Marku42.net, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn, FloridaGeekScene.com, GeekCast Radio Network. We're everywhere around the web. I want to thank Nicholas Briggs once again, Christian Basil, Kayla Ascalillo, Patty Hawkins, and myself. I would like to thank myself. It's always nice to thank yourself and pat yourself on the back. I think. <laughs> uh, until no ego next, there. Until next week, can we have a Jadoon sign us off? Go for Bo, goodbye. Bye, everyone. Give that man a glass of water while you're at it. <laughs> Marku 42 was written and presented by Mark Baumgarten, Kayla Ascalillo, Patty Hawkins, and Christian Basil. This episode was edited, directed, and produced by Mark Baumgarten. Visit Marku42.net where you can register and become part of the Hooniverse Army. We can be contacted by email at mark at marku42, subject line, question mark. If you'd like a chance to be a guest on our radio show, send an email to our media relations director, Christian Basil, at marku42media at yahoo.com. You can have Marku42 entertain at your next event or convention. Go to heroesonhand.com slash marku42. Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. This show is owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten 2016. This is Krypton Radio.